So your LDL cholesterol is high. Do we need to address it? How aggressive do we need to be? What do you need to do? This is kind of a controversial topic in medicine. So just to summarize really quick, depends on how aggressive you want to be. If you have a high risk family history, family history of your parents, grandparents, first degree relatives having strokes, heart attacks, vascular events in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you should probably be a little bit more aggressive. You know, but it's controversial because there's two kind of polar opposite views. We have most cardiologists who think babies are statin deficient and need to have aggressive lipid management at an early age. You have functional medicine providers who think nobody needs cholesterol management because our hormones are made from cholesterol and we need all that we can get. Where do I stand? What do you need to do? Dietary cholesterol does not have as much of an impact as everybody makes it out to be. I mean, 20, 25% of the population do absorb quite a bit of cholesterol from their diet. I do like you to choose leaner cuts of meat, proteins, you know, 96, four ground beef over 80, 20, sirloin over ribeye, ground turkey, chicken, that kind of stuff. But I don't want to demonize eggs. I mean, like you can have eggs. Eggs are an unesterified form of cholesterol. And so it's still absorbed well without much of an impact on your cholesterol profile. So let's say your cholesterol panel is elevated a little bit. And what does that mean? So traditional cholesterol panel has total cholesterol, HDL, which is the quote unquote good cholesterol, LDL, which is the quote unquote bad cholesterol and triglycerides. Triglycerides do give us an insight to kind of your metabolic health. And, but LDL is really the thing that everybody focused on with the studies have been performed on and everything. So I'm really going to hone in on that. Yeah. So when what's called Mendelian ran randomization trials were performed, they show that overall lifetime exposure to LDL, the higher it is, the higher chance for strokes, heart attacks, vascular events, that kind of stuff. So that's where a lot of the aggressive lowering came from. The lowering did show that every decrease of 39 points in your LDL resulted in less strokes, heart attacks, cancer. And these are large meta-analysis studies. But I don't think LDL cholesterol is, but I think LDL cholesterol is just a little picture. We can get a little bit deeper into it if you want. And do these extra tests matter? Because at the end of the day, if you're high risk, I'm going to really promote aggressive lowering anyways. But if we're kind of on the fence on should we treat this aggressively or not, we can get a deeper look. What would those labs look like? Apolaproprotein B is kind of a carrying case on every LDL particle that is the plaque promoting part of that LDL particle. And so when cholesterol goes in and out of a cell, if it gets stuck, that's where plaque builds up and stuff. And it's typically these ApoB particles that are getting stuck. So if we measure that, that gives us a little bit better insight plaque promoting particles you have. LP little a is a genetic form of cholesterol that is smaller and stickier and more likely to cause atherosclerosis and heart disease. In these individuals, I'm going to want to be more aggressive with your diet. The problem with people who are positive for LP little a is that the meds don't change it too much. Estradiol may improve it. PCSK nines may improve it, but statins and other medications do not improve it. So don't let your primary care provider put you on a statin for LP little a reduction specifically. This is only a one-time test. You don't need to check it every time. If you're negative, then you're negative. If you're positive, we do follow it though. Apolipoprotein A1 may kind of shows you how effective your HDL particles are and may provide us a little bit of insight on cholesterol removing from your diet and everything. We can check a high sensitive C reactive protein that gives us an insight on total body inflammation and it's more sensitive than the typical CRP we use. Because if you don't have inflammation, or it's very low, then these particles are more likely to pass freely in and out of the vessel walls and unlikely to get stuck. So we don't have to be as aggressive if this is lower, but it's very nonspecific and does not really 
tell us too much aside just inflammation or not. Homocysteine is an amino acid that we can check that may also be related to arterial wall function or endothelial dysfunction. We can treat this by increasing B vitamins, specifically methylated B vitamins, if this is high. So this is something that we can do. Um, NMR, li <clears throat> NMR lipoprotein profile measures the particle size of these LDLs. Smaller particle sizes get stuck more, are more plaque promoting, and bigger, fluffier, cloud-shaped particle sizes pass more freely. And so these are kind of the advanced cholesterol. This is the more advanced cholesterol testing that we can do. If you have a high LDL on your traditional cholesterol panel, but don't really want to treat the cholesterol unless we have to. But at the end of the day, does it change much? Because if you're high risk, a lot of times I'm just going to really want to treat you. Do we need to do this more in depth testing? to really decide. So I'll kind of lay, leave that into your hands. If you want me to do this, we can, and then we can decide how aggressive we want to be. Say you are high risk. You don't want any of this advanced testing. You don't want to be treated. What's another option? A coronary CT scan can give us a little bit of insight if you already have plaque deposition. And so we could get that. The problem is if it's good and bad. If you come back as zero, that's great. However, that can sometimes give a false sense of security that you feel like you don't need to be treated, but that really lags about 10 years. You can get a coronary CT scan with contrast and this shows more soft plaques and it may only lag by three to five years, but it's still three to five years, you know? And so if it's negative or zero, then that does give us some reassurance, but if you are building, it's not gonna show it until later. But if you do already have a significant amount of calcified plaque, then that lets me know that we probably need to be more aggressive with it. And then say we get this advanced testing, we get the coronary CT scan or not, what do we do about it? You know, from a supplement standpoint, there's a few things that may move the needle a little bit. Citrus bergamot is a supplement and it does seem to be comparable to rosuvastatin, so it may help a little bit. I do like berberine. It improves hemoglobin A1C, improves insulin sensitivity, and it may lower LDL cholesterol. And so that's something else. Just increasing dietary soluble fiber in your diet a lot of times will help decrease cholesterol as well. Niacin is something I've seen a lot that it does seem to improve HDL, but outcome studies do not show a significant decrease in major coronary events. So Niacin is a kind of a hit or miss with it. High dose fish oil is something I like a lot. And what I really want most people to be on if they have any type of abnormal lipid profile, it's going to help lower triglycerides and it may help improve particle size to where things are less likely to get stuck. Two to four grams, a mix between the EPA and DHA. It also seems to lower total body inflammation. And then prescriptions. A lot of times I start with azetamide. It blocks the absorption of cholesterol in your gut. It's pretty mild, but a lot of people can achieve a good reduction in their LDL with just azetamide alone. The next prescription are statins. They are readily available. They're typically cost-effective and do a great job at reducing cholesterol. They do have some side effects. They're typically well-controlled. They do have some side, side effects. They're typically mild, so they do have some side effects. Less than 10% of people really seem to have any side effects with them. And truly their role in primary prevention is still kind of up in the air. What does that mean? Primary prevention is keeping healthy people healthy. They do provide great secondary prevention, meaning if you've already had an event, stroke, heart attacks, or some sort of vascular event, you need to be on a statin because they do have tons of data to show that they help with, you know, cardiac preventing ad adverse cardiac remodeling and other things. Secondary prevention, they're still very viable. Depends on how high of a risk you are in primary prevention. 
Vimpadoic acid and PCSK9 inhibitors are the top dogs, but they're very expensive. And their role in primary prevention is still being studied. Do they work at keeping healthy people healthy and prolong longevity? You know, overall lifespan or health span? We don't really know that yet because they are pretty new. And they run, you know, it's like five or $600 a month to treat. Treating cholesterol is not very sexy. You don't feel it. Insurance doesn't cover these unless you've already had an event. And so I'm not using them much unless somebody really wants to be as aggressive as it can. Hormone replacement does provide positive improvement in lipid profile as well. Estradiol lowers LP little a, increases HDL, and is largely why women don't have much coronary events until they get postmenopause. So estradiol is protective. Testosterone can improve lipid profiles. It improves insulin sensitivity. So triglycerides come down. It helps decrease visceral fat. HDL goes up, but that is typically not until a year or two of continuous usage. Thyroid optimization also helps improve LDL and particle size. There are validated risk calculators. The ASCVD risk calculator is the most validated. And you can just plug in your numbers, your age, if you smoke, if you have diabetes, and that kind of lets you know your risk factor for a major coronary event in the next five to 10 years. To summarize, do we need to treat cholesterol? I wanted to make this video to give you the information to help you decide as yourself, because I do still think that treating cholesterol and getting much tighter LDL and ApoB numbers does decrease events, strokes, heart attacks, vascular events. And so I do think that has a place, but if you are good and insulin sensitive, you have low total body inflammation, you're active, you're improving your diet, we don't need to be too aggressive. But if you're already showing signs of prediabetes, diabetes, you're a smoker, your dad had a heart attack at 50, yeah, let's be a little bit more aggressive. Um, and so if you have any questions, of course, text or call, but I just wanted to get this out there so you have the information yourself and my views on it. Thanks. I know cholesterol isn't very sexy to talk about, but I'm just trying to get as much information as I can out there. It is hard to combat so, some of the social media stuff, and it is easy to just not want to control cholesterol. You don't see it, you don't feel it. And, you know, if somebody says that you don't need to control it, then it's a lot easier to believe that than realistically looking at the data to show that lifetime decreased exposure of LDL and ApoB particles seem to result in less strokes, heart attacks. So I do think treating it needs to be on at least people's radar if they want me to treat them and how aggressive to be with it. And so um, I must keep trying to get, I know cholesterol isn't very sexy to talk about, but I'm just trying to get as much information as I can out there. It is hard to combat so, some of the social media stuff, and it is easy to just not want to control cholesterol. You don't see it, you don't feel it. And, you know, if somebody says that you don't need to control it, then it's a lot easier to believe that than realistically looking at the data to show that lifetime decreased exposure of LDL and ApoB particles seem to result in less strokes, heart attacks. So I do think treating it needs to be on at least people's radar if they want me to treat them and how aggressive to be with it. And so I must keep trying to get more info, more topics out like this. If you have any questions, reach out, like, and subscribe, comment with any more questions you have for me.